Welcome to Visionaries Global Media, your number one source for podcasting entertainment. Visionaries Global Media, envisioning excellence on a global scale. This is Band from Ringside. Tonight on the Band from Ringside podcast, Daniel Bryan is a free agent. AEW had its blood and guts show last night. We have an early match of the year contender with Shingo versus Osprey at NJPW. It was unbelievable. That and a whole bunch more tonight on the Band from Ringside podcast. Ditch that nine to five. It's time to feel alive. Hello, Marks. So welcome to the Band for Ringside podcast. As always, I'm your host, Bill Vagie, a.k.a. Synchro de Gallo. And out there in Edwardsville, Illinois, we have Two Beer, Zach Bowman. What's going on, Two Beer? Not a lot. Uh, I know uh, Michael Wallace Fields and his uh, very touching 200th uh, episode video that he sent us uh, was talking about the first time that he listened to us he's like ah oh, this song's corny as fuck uh i get hyped every time i hear it now it, it really gets me in the mood <laughs> but the first time you heard it, it's probably corny as fuck though <laughs> no go ahead go it's ahead. sitting right across from me in his beautiful south city apartment we have jason cornelius bell what's going on jcb you said beautiful that's too sweet allow us to bow our heads as i read from the latest edition of the band for ringside podcast Volume 204, Chapter 3, Verse 14 of the Good Smart Say a Hashtag, Boo the Heels. It is all good, baby. Listen, share, subscribe, repeat. Um, interesting week of wrestling. Just some quick shout-outs. Um, big shout-out to Walgreens today, giving me my first shot of COVID. I'm waiting for my black Superman powers to kick in. Walgreens gave you COVID? Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 my COVID shots, there I say. Um Arm hurts a little bit, but, you know, like I said, I'm waiting for the uh, the Black Superman powers to kick in any moment now. So if I start ripping the table up or, you know, flying out of the room, pay me no mind. I'm just getting used to some shit. Um, shout you out. know Warner Brothers is casting a Black Superman, so you should throw yeah, your hat in the ring. That, that's the whole, the total reason I said it. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck? Who's, what's this Black Superman shit? I was about to say, I must not read enough comic books nowadays. Um, shout out to Chelsea. On to the Champions League finals. Can't believe that shit. Outside of that, same old shit. Ready to talk a little wrestling. Yeah, we got, like I said, we're coming at you from South City. I'm back and better than ever. Uh-oh. I've been I've been moved out of South City for exactly six days and I couldn't stand it. So I've been back here twice in the last six days and Jason's been out to St. Charles once. So You were uh, anxious for that uh, Kings Highway traffic, weren't you? You just oh couldn't wait to get back in it. God, that Kings Highway and traffic also, was terrible. I don't think uh, St. Charles is too fond of Jason. <laughs> not anything about him specifically, but you know. Well, I knew he was coming over the other day. I knew he was coming over, so I knocked on both my next door neighbors' homes. I was like, right. "This guy's a friend of mine." Okay, he's not a prowler. I swear to God. I made sure my ass stayed inside for the majority of that visit. But uh, it stops. South City, you know, it looks so much different than last since the last time I was here. Um, yeah, right. A whopping what three days ago. Before we get too far into it, we got some sad news about F and B Eatery, a uh, longtime sponsor, longtime friend. Uh, they couldn't withstand COVID, and that is no shame on them. That it, COVID has taken out much uh, much better places than them, and there's not a whole lot of better places than them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so bummer. So. You know, I'm not saying this because we lost a sponsor. I'm just saying this to, I always say at the end of this uh, podcast, to support your local restaurants. And that's not a joke. I say support your local weed dealers. That's not a joke either. But restaurants seem to be having a harder time now. So if you're going to get some food. It's that goddamn unemployment. Nobody wants to work. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. (laughs) The invisible hand of the market. Unless uh, the invisible hand of the market wants people, wants businesses to pay people more, then the invisible hand of the market's like, no, it's unemployment's fault. Now the hand comes invisible. So if you don't feel like cooking some night, uh, just go ahead and reach out to your local restaurants, your local burger joint, your local sub joint, whatever it may be. Don't go to Subway. Don't go to fast food. Just go out and get who's ever closest to you. Because all we can do. Hey. Yes. 
Mother's Day is coming up. I mm. bought, uh, you know, Bill's bath bombs is a great Mother's Day Look present. At you. But I, I should have thought of that because I went out and bought from other local vendors. Uh, I bought uh, my mom some CBD honey from a local uh, friend of mine who has a hemp farm makes CBD honey, and she puts it in her tea in the morning. It helps with her shoulder. She's sixty-five, and uh, bought that's my, my nick- wife. That's a my nickname from a local- for your mom. <laughs> and That's I bought a, fucked. I bought my wife a necklace um. from a local like jeweler. So yeah, CBD, honey, Jesus Christ. Sorry. Uh, yeah, but seriously, go out and support your local restaurants because they are hurting. And even if it seems like COVID's over, it's not necessarily over, and they're still hurting because you don't. You guys don't need me to tell you this, but COVID has changed a lot of shit. So oh, shit. Uh, you know, without further ado. R.I.P. F and B. We love you. We yeah. hardly knew ye, uh, and I, I, you know, I'm sure they'll land on their feet. Yeah, big uh, shout out to Mike, man. I was about to say, I reached out to him. You know, he's 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 keeping his head up, and that's the biggest thing. And I just told him, you know, if he needed anything, any kind of help, you know, please don't don't be afraid to reach out because that's why I, I'm here. Because, like I said at the very beginning, this was personal to me. This goes back to the Shock City days. This I know Mike personally. We waited tables together. So in, to a certain scenario, that's like my brother. You know what I'm saying? And I You were in the trenches together. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? If you ever worked in a restaurant, you, you kind of feel that scenario. The restaurant becomes your family because you're not – you're not there for those certain family events that you have to miss because you work in that restaurant. So that being said, he is like my brother and I hate to see that happen. And I know he's going to bounce back. So like I said, shout out to Mikey, you know, keep your head up brother from your lips to God. Instead, uh, instead of mustard gas, it's mustard on the side. It's a different kind of war. <laughs> Let's get this to that three <laughs> counts. One, two, three. JCB kick us off. Well, we usually want, thank you. We usually want to go chronologically, but we're going to jump uh, a step ahead just because this could be a change, a game changer. It couldn't be, but we're, we're going to go ahead and discuss it anyway. One Daniel Bryan's contract has ended with the WWE. So, if you watched SmackDown on Friday night, they had set up a title match with. Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan. If Daniel Bryan loses, he leaves SmackDown. So, just in case you haven't seen it, spoiler alert, listen away. Roman Reigns wins the title, but then after the match, Jey Uso comes out, gets the interference in. Uh, Cesaro comes out to try to make the save, but Roman Reigns and Jey Uso hem him up in the ropes to where he's basically tied up in the ropes to watch Daniel Bryan get the concerto from Roman Reigns, which, once again... Roman Reigns is goddamn. He's a great fucking heel. I mean, it's a great heel. Jesus Christ! <laughs> it was it was oh, it was a great match too. It was it a was twenty-seven a minute match, TV yeah. match. Daniel Bryan wrestled his ass off. Um, had him had Roman in a couple of submissions where, as they say, he could he could get a good match out of a broomstick. Yeah, and this one, I won't say Roman Reigns has is a broomstick by any stretch of the imagination. He's, no. de- he's definitely stepped his game up in the ring. And more so on the promo side, more like a mop. <laughs> just kidding. It's more like I, one of those big, like uh, those big, like wet or dry nor- mops that yeah. you janitors push around the basketball court. <laughs> I'll say I use one of those. Don't start. Um, I guess it, just looking towards the Daniel Bryan not being around, his contract is up. The way that they ended SmackDown with Daniel Bryan taking the concerto, I guess, is their safety net just in case Daniel Bryan doesn't come back you have kind of wrote him off effectively from wwe storyline you know he is now in the alumni section of wwe what exactly that means one doesn't know so i guess the question to the panel is where does daniel bryan go next i'll start first i'm very pessimistic about this whole thing i think he ultimately stays i think comfort is a big thing i think the two guys that are going to come up next that our family man one is one's going to be there's something to be about something to be said about being around family and being comfortable and not rocking the boat if you absolutely don't have to do i think he's going to do like a tour to cody and kind of like go around and get his little uh notepad out and write names down of guys he wants to wrestle and get that shit done yep 
But ultimately, I think he goes back to WWE, goes backstage on small, Raw, SmackDown, whatever the case may be, and does more creative. Zach, what do you think? I I agree with Jason. Uh, he might not even do that tour. If it was me personally, I would love to see him as a legitimate free agent, like not signed exclusively, just going where he can go because he's fucking Brian Danielson and everybody wants to wrestle matches with him. So that would be my dream scenario. But like Jason said, you know, that backstage, that paycheck, I know he's not a driven by money kind of guy, uh, but yeah, he's a family guy. You got the security of collecting a paycheck and, you know, being involved in a, in the biggest wrestling organization in the world. He's been there since 2009 outside of a brief hiatus when he choked Justin Roberts with a tie. Uh, but, <laughs> It'd That's be funny if, if he did show up in AEW if they relive that moment. Oh like, yeah, that yeah. Oh, you great. you have got to have if that happens, you have to at least have them cross paths and kind of look at each other, Justin, kind of like, "Hey, Brian." They're all going to be like, "No, hey, Daniel." He'd be like, "No, it's Brian, motherfucker, it's Brian." You know, kind of go <laughs> after him or something like that. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, like we'll we'll see how it plays out. Uh, we're fond of saying that around here. We'll, we'll just wait and see how it plays out. But yeah, dream match. I'd love to see him wrestle at Arena Mexico. I'd love to see him wrestle. Uh, Phil with Tom Lawler on New Japan Strong. I'd love to see him wrestle mm. Kenny Omega. Obviously, you know. So I'm anxious. I think it's cool, but at the same time, this could be like a legit work, and it's expired. But they already talked, and he's coming back, and they're doing it for a big angle. So. Well, apparently he's his contract expired a while ago. I read it like was, a it, few months. Yeah, April and, April thirtieth. Okay, like was it was, uh, it was okay. like basically he was signed. Nobody knew how long he was signed, but it was essentially like Smack WrestleMania. He's essentially, like, I'm, we're going to do this WrestleMania. So I'll I'll um I agree with you guys. I I. I, I'm not sure if he's going to even do that tour either. I think ultimately he ends up with WWE because he knows that's how he can make the most money. He's not getting any younger. None of us are. Right. Uh, but he does, you know, everybody does want, everybody does want to have some comfort for their kids and shit to fall back on. Should anything bad happen? And his wife, to play devil's advocate, if anybody would do it just for the love of pro wrestling, it seems like it would be Brian Danielson. It yeah. seems like he would say, you know, I might take just like Cody did, but on a bigger level because he's Brian Danielson <laughs> and Cody's Cody. Like, Brian, Dan like as great as Cody is, yeah. Brian Danielson really of, of the last 15 years certainly is the most important wrestler in the world. Everywhere, I remember Jericho saying it that I, I've said on this podcast before. Many times. Okay, do you not want me to repeat no, it? No, no, but no, because it rings true. <laughs> it, Jericho said, if uh, I never worried about Brian, Daniel, Brian Danielson getting over in WWE because he gets over everywhere. He kind of changed NXT um, because it would, used to be kind of like a game show yeah. before he got there. And then him and Miz had that great rivalry. And then he kind of changed. He kind of changed the landscape of the WWE permanently at WrestleMania 30. When he ended up, you know, that was the Dana Bryan WrestleMania. It was a great moment. It was a great story. I mean, and it almost kind of changed the perspective of WWE entirely because it worked so well for them to beat him and beat him and beat him, and he was this underdog that overcame it. But that's what they do with all baby faces for right. the last fucking seven, eight years. Right. So right to the point where they overdo it, and it's uh, they, they've uh, they've taken it over and made it not as good as it was then. Everything seems like a copy of that now. A lot of times, even though that was almost a copy of the. I don't well, know. Kofi was that copy for a little bit, but Kofi, I think, rings a little different because he was. He was different because obviously he, he was uh, the number one reason he's black, but number two, he's been in WWE for so long. He was that essential, I won't say journeyman, but just seemed like he was that essential mid card guy that could never get over the hump for whatever reason. And then all of a sudden now we've given him this chance, and then Kofi Mania just kind of took 
steam and the perfect foil for Kofi Mania was the guy that paved the way for Kofi Mania and being Daniel Bryan. That's what made, to me, that whole storyline be great. And the ch- the capper was the match itself was off the fucking chain. I mean, damn, you had grown man fucking crying for Christ's sake. And Daniel Bryan was involved in that, too. Right. Daniel Bryan was the one that put Kofi over, which is the, the difference between Daniel Bryan and everybody else, and this includes Kofi, and I say this with all due respect to all of them, is that Daniel Bryan doesn't have bad matches. He is... He is a machine. He is a... That motherfucker got good matches out of the feed. <laughs> he got good matches out of big casts. I was going to say... Um, oh, yeah. Eric, I was going to say Eric that. Rowan was the one guy that I was just like, there's no way this could be good. And he made that actually be good. So, I mean, yeah, it's kudos to Dane Bryan. The thing sure. that I keep coming back to, because Dana Bryan's kind of been on a, on a press tour kind of lately, and he... He gave a, an interview. I forgot where I read it, and I apologize for not citing my sources. But you know, we're just a local podcast. We yeah, just right. get drunk and get high, and we talk about wrestling. <laughs> I'm not a journalist, yeah, right? But he, I, I know that he said when people compare. I know he's been very, uh, he's been very uh, he, he complimentary. Said, to, complimentary, thank you to AEW. Yeah. But he has also said when people compare, he doesn't like when people compare matches in WWE to matches in other promotions around the world because it's not the same thing. Now, he has said that in interviews recently, basically saying, yeah, you can't have your best matches at WWE, yet that guy pulls out outstanding matches. If there was a a list of WWE best matches of 2021, that WrestleMania match has to be on it, and obviously you have Daniel. The one on SmackDown was really fucking good too. too. So I mean, I'd say in the last ten years, if you put a list of uh, WWE matches that were the best, like main roster matches, he'd be on more of them than not. I would say if out of ten, I would give. A, I would three, say at least three spots would have a Daniel Bryan name in there in some form. So two beer, why don't you why don't you fancy book it for me? Your best scenario. For the best six months of Daniel Bryan. Uh, it includes a G1. Yes. For sure. Uh, it includes a uh, surprise entrance on Dynamite with no hype of anybody coming in. Just him showing up. And um, maybe, you know, some of those AW guys could be in the G1 and it starts a feud. Uh, a la, you know, like Suzuki or, you know, something like that. Um, you know, and uh, even still, like I said, the free agent thing, like going down to Arena Mexico, wrestling for this new uh, Federation down there where Andrade is going to be wrestling, uh, Rusha's promotion. Mm-hmm. And, like, you know, going back to ROH, you know, going back Dude, to the, group, the American Dragon. What the fuck are you stole my answer, son of a bitch? You stole my so that, answer. That's my dream scenario is that he remains a true free agent. And because the wrestling landscape – on the non WWE skills, it's changed a lot, and there's a lot of collaboration, and it means that he might not necessarily need to be signed exclusively. And because he's been making money for so long, and his wife fucking makes great money too, like they're not looking, you know, they're not, you know, dreading winter at this point, you know, like it's it's they're doing well. Um, so if he could remain a true free agent and just take a little less money to not have that exclusive thing, and uh, that that would be my dream scenario. Jason? No, uh, the ROH scenario was the one that I thought of immediately because when they uh, when ROH kind of relaunched or whatever, they started with the Pure Rules tournament and that's what got me back watching ROH again and it was basically centered around Daniel Bryan uh, Bryan Danielson um, well Cesaro but I can't think of his name but when he was in ROH Claudio Castiglioli thank you very much Uh, Tyler Black you know Samoa Joe guys along these lines Jay Lethal that had won the pure championship Samoa Joe also a free agent right okay so more so Samoa Joe I wouldn't I would expect to kind of go like maybe the impact route but once again it kind of two beers said it best these guys don't really, especially just to the topic of the conversation, 
Brian Danielson, Jesus Christ, <laughs> Daniel Bryan doesn't have to sign with anybody. I agree with Zach, and that's why I said I call it the tour to Cody. If he just bounces around, you can get the the dream match you want in a one shot deal, especially if you wait until July, where apparently you're going to have like live fans and all this other good shit. If you wait, then you can really reap that benefit, not only with you know the the gate itself, but then the exposure even more so, where it could really be a big fucking deal. Now, I don't want to be a downer. But there is a good chance that he is just negotiating his deal with WWE in terms of appearances, money. You know, does he show up at WrestleMania every year a la Undertaker or something like that? But the guy clearly wants to wrestle. And, you know, to quote Mark Henry, he's got plenty left in the tank. Right. I mean, because he just had... A spectacular WrestleMania match and probably the best SmackDown match of the last two years, Friday yeah, night. That joke was a barn burner. It was a barn burner. <laughs> Even so, though you knew what was going to happen, it was still fucking good. It is very... Ex- it's, it's, like, Edge got $3 million because he said that's what Tony Khan offered him. And <laughs> Tony Khan did not offer him $3 million. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, you know what I mean? Plus, it's not like WWE is hemorrhaging money. It's like no they, they're they're making tons of money. They, idiot proof. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, they'll make money despite it, in yeah. spite of themselves, yeah. as uh, Phil Brooks once says. I, as much as I think about, speaking of CM Punk, as much as I think about him coming back, I would rather, rather Daniel Bryan keep wrestling than CM Punk come back. I just think that, I don't know, CM Punk, he's just, no. you know what, I don't even want to make this about him. I'm just excited to see what happens with Daniel Bryan. And there was a f- couple years ago when we were like, man, if Dean Ambrose, we didn't John think Moxley, coming back. if, well, there was a couple years ago where we were talking about the G1. We were like, mm-hmm. man, if John Moxley shows up in the G1, that would fucking rule. And he came to the G1, and guess what? It fucking ruled. True story. So I don't think there's any way that Daniel Bryan shows up in the G1, but God damn. Damn, if he did, how many matches are there that you'd want to see with <laughs> fucking Daniel Bryan in the Christ. G1? He better be in the fucking A block, is all I got to say. We don't even know what the A block is yet. Come it's down. always a better block. I just, I just got to see him versus Yano. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> My uh, hand's getting ready to explode. Speaking of New Japan, <laughs> let's get to that two count. Two beer, what's the two count? Uh, two count was uh, one of the best matches I've ever seen in my life. This was a match of the year candidate, as Bill said in the intro. Uh, I don't really, it'd be hard pressed, anybody's going to be hard pressed to outdo this match uh, regardless. Uh, you know, Daniel Bryan showing up in the G1 might be able to, to do it with, a, you know, an Ishii or an Okada or something like that. But at the same time, this thing was an epic, as Jason said in our text thread, instant classic. And uh, I got slammed yesterday every single mile because I work at a brewery. <laughs> and uh, we were very busy, so I didn't get to watch this until this morning. And I was just texting these guys. I was like, oh, my God. I was like, he just did a Made in Japan through two tables. Oh, my God. The Made in Japan in the ring looks even worse than that. He dropped him on his head. Yeah. <laughs> and just absolute barn burner. I mean, it was 45 minutes. Uh, you know, definitely built like a long match. But I saw stuff in this match that I've never seen in my life. Did you and Did you I name think, the two wrestlers? Shingo Takagi and Will Ospreay. No, I did not. I, I was say, I okay, yeah. all right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the it was yeah, the main think, event at night two of Dentaku. Yes, for the IWGP Heavyweight Championship. So wait a minute. Um, <laughs> I I did not. Yeah, I did not expect. Takagi to win, and he did not. Uh, but my God, these guys put on a show. I never thought they'd do a better match in their 2019 Best of Super Juniors, which was match of the year, and then they do shit like this. And um, These guys are just two of the best in the world now, and two of the best who ever did it. Uh, Takagi is kind of in his twilight years, although you never fucking know it. Uh, he spent 10 years in Dragon Gate, um, which I would love access to be able to go back and watch those matches, because I'm sure they were also fire. He's like 
one of my favorite guys ever in a very short period of time that I was introduced to him uh, since he's been in New Japan, and they've booked him so good. Uh, but he's a total powerhouse. His facial expressions are like second to none. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of cool athletic shit from Will Ospreay. Uh, at one point, Shingo had his foot. He caught a kick and flipped him ass over fucking tea kettle. Uh, it, I just saw that. 540. I, I just kind of peeked my head o- over to my right or whatever. My TV's to my right, and I looked over, and th- that spot you're just talking about, sh- it just came I'm up. not sure we've ever that, – that's never happened, right? Nobody's ever done that? I, it might have happened, I, but, I mean, it's so it rare. Have, yeah, he, he pulled it out, like – and I'm sure it probably did happen, but the, with the force that he hit, it just was so impactful. And, yeah, I've probably seen it in, like, the Lucha Libre match or whatever, but the way that they did it – because the rest of the match was so hard hitting and he fucking flopped himself hard on that mat. It just really kind of, that was, I think the moment that this match went to the next level, it was probably 20 minutes in and then it just built from there. And these guys are phenomenal. Like I can't speak any more highly about this match, like easily five stars. It completely earned its 44 minutes. Jason, what do you think? Um, actually, Two Beer kind of stole my thunder a little bit about the 20-minute mark. I kind of looked up because I kind of listened for, you know, the time where, you know, the ring announcer is like 10, 15, 20 minutes or whatever. And I knew it was at least going to be 30. You know, it's it's the title match. It's the, the main event of the, the night and basically the main event of the tour. So it's going to get its time. With, with cancellations on the show. Yeah, yeah. 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 Quick, quick, quick sidebar. What happened with uh, Yo and Despy? I, I've been was watching it. There's a six, there was a six man tag, and uh, at least one of those guys test positive for COVID, mm-hmm. so that he took all six people that were in that six man tag out. So that's why they were all off the show. Okay, because they're just super careful. No, no, I, I totally get that. I, I just wasn't sure because I, when I was watching it, uh, I guess that was the following morning, Sunday or Saturday morning or whatever. Whatever day it was, they all kind of melt together. <laughs> I got up and I was like, okay, you got to watch New Japan so you don't catch any spoilers. That was like um, the first announcement. It was in, you know, Japanese commentary, which once again, I don't give a rat's ass what kind of commentary it was. Shingo and Will Ospreay translates in any fucking language. Okay, them motherfuckers was was losing their goddamn minds. And I loved every minute of to me that added to the match. And I love Kevin Kelly. Absolutely amazing. Like I said, him and Excalibur, depending on, you know, who you like, what you like. To me, they're one and one A when it comes to play by play. But this Japanese announced team just kind of added to the drama of what was happening in the ring. The spots where they were throwing tables at each other. I mean, come on, you know, you that's where I was like, you don't see that shit. But then, like you said, the main in uh, Japan going through the tables, that shit you didn't see. Will Ospreay kind of, you know, digging into a little deeper, darker uh, heel side. You don't see that. So, I mean, there was so much shit that they compacted into 45 minutes. The 20-minute mark was kind of like, okay, we're setting the foundation. And that next 25 was just balls to the wall. Yeah, I don't mind the slow buildup if – if it's for a big deal, and if the rest of it pays off. Um, Osprey was doing Kushida stuff because yeah. they had they had the mo- they had the match at Dentaku two years ago. What's the move called when Osprey comes behind him and the hidden blade or whatever? The hidden blade and Shingo ducked one. And I watched it like four times. I was like, "How did he know exactly when the duck?" I was, I was. It was like watching a magic it was trick. So impressive, right? It was, it was like so it, it was like watching David Blaine or something. It's right. like I'm trying to find the point. Like, what was his cue? Was there somebody in front of him that he was looking at? But he was looking straight down. Yeah, because it's not, and it's not like the arena's empty. I mean, they're quiet, right? But, but it's, it's see, a clap crowd. Yeah, and he ducked at exactly the right time. I'm like, what the. fuck? Fuck just <laughs> oh, I mar- I marked out for that, and that's when that's when I texted you guys. I was like, we're going to talk about this bonkers ass match, right? Because it was a bonkers ass match. Kevin Kelly, who 
even said that he tries not to veer towards hyperbole. At the end of the match, Kevin Kelly goes, I try not to veer towards hyperbole, and I know that we're all victims of the moment, which was a great call. That's just a great call after a match. He goes, that's the greatest match I've ever called. He said, I've called Okada Omega. He rattled off a bunch of matches that he called. He said, that's the best match I've ever called. For Kevin Kelly to say that. I love that, that call. I did too, man. For him to say that. No matter what you think, I mean, now Omega and Okada have had. <laughs> yeah, you see me over here, like, well, I don't know. <laughs> That's seventy three minute bar murder. You can tell me what you want, but, but go ahead. it's it says something about it because I don't think that Kevin Kelly was doing doing it trying to put it over more. It wasn't like he Michael didn't have to. It wasn't like Michael Cole being like, "This is the biggest SmackDown match right. we've ever had," or something. Yeah. That's Kevin Kelly who's doing New Japan English commentary and saying that. That counts for something. It counts totally. for a lot, he, yeah. like, So if you go back and watch those uh, Nitros that uh, were on whenever we were younger, uh, Tony Schiavone is like the biggest victim of that, which he doesn't do in AEW because he's learned from his past mistakes. Mm. Um, he's <laughs> Don't dead give away his Monday older. night. <laughs> Don't yeah, give away exactly. the spoiler, motherfucker. Every Monday night's the biggest fucking night, you know, like back then. It was like, you've never seen anything like this. And, you know... Every week, like, it worked on me when I was 11, but, you know, like, if I was an adult, like, it would have been a little bit different, but, uh, you know, Kevin Kelly has respectability as a announcer because, like he says, he tries not, he tries to veer away from hyperbole, which I suffer from on this podcast. Uh, <laughs> you don't, don't the, say. <laughs> I don't have the integrity that Kevin Kelly does, and I think that's one thing that makes him one of the greatest announcers of all time in my opinion, is because of the quality of matches that he's able to, to call and the well, the fact that he just does it so well. He called the fuck out of that match. That match See, was... I, I, like I said, I didn't wait for the English commentary. I need. I guess I need to go back and watch that shit because, I mean, it, it doesn't... Re- ultimately, it doesn't matter. I'll be watching it just to watch it, but Kevin Kelly, like I said, it just adds a little bit. Hit, if Morrow comes back at some point, oh, fuck. that would be, you know... The holy trinity of play by play announcers when it comes Hyper to hyperbole personified, <laughs> you know, like. But I mean, as wrestling fans, we're always victims of the moment, and we're always trying to fancy book the next thing, of course. right? And and chase that next high, right? You know, like we, like right? These but guys like, like are killing us with how good wrestling is these days, that, and the, that's the exactly things that they're able to overachieve it's crazy that's exactly what i was gonna say it's like that is a match that you don't get that often you know a couple times a year maybe but that if you're lucky but that type of match i it i i turned that match off and then i turned on some other wrestling and it was just like the fucking balloon had all the air taken out of it. It's like I wanted every it, – it was basically like, you know, when you do a bunch of blow and then it's the end of the night Mm-mm. and you're like, I'm not hungry, but I got to eat and I'm too tired, but I can't go to sleep. Right. That's what the rest of wrestling looked like at, after that. And no, I, I agree. I, it, it, the adrenaline was still going analogy. after the fact where I was like, okay, you know, I just – I got to sit here. I, I smoked a cigarette. I was like, man, that shit was so fucking – Good to the point where I was just like, man, I wish there was something else behind this, or we could see backstage. But I was not... looking for backstage comments, like, and I was like, fuck, they're not up yet. I'm and like, the reason that, the it. reason it was so great is because there's nothing, because there is nothing behind it. You know, you know, you're at the end, and it's, you know, when you're watching a great match and the and you get the three count, and it's always a disappointment because you're like, ah, I want Damn, I, like you over. literally wanted them to fight forever. Yeah, and over. that's what that's what I wanted out of Osprey and Shingo in that match. And I want I was waiting for Okada to come out, and that was the next thing because this is why I love fucking New Japan. They don't fucking wait. You know what I'm saying? They just tell you what's next. So right. I'm waiting. You know, Osprey's getting his flowers or whatever. So I'm just kind of like, okay. Come on, <laughs> Okada, whenever you're ready. And he never came out, which makes it to me even more perfect because now you've, you've got me over here salivating like a fucking hungry dog for this next match. The, the match that Will Ospreay has basically circled, this is his fucking, you know, Moby Dick moment. And now I'm like, okay, and Okada's not going to come out for this? That's just perfect, dude. That's why I, 
quick sidebar for 30 seconds. I was watching um, the Randy Savage uh, A&E documentary, and they were talking about the uh, the Ricky uh, Steamboat um, WrestleMania, WrestleMania match. Yep. They had never wrestled up until that point. Never wrestled to that point. Can you imagine? And it, it was less than 11 minutes, too. Yeah, right. <laughs> Can you imagine? You know that story, like, or you saw it, so you saw the story of Ricky Steamboat, how Savage laid that whole match out, and there was, like, 160 spots, and he would call Ricky Steamboat in the middle of the night and be like, what's spot 37? Dude, I'm going like, to sleep. Elbow. <laughs> yeah. no, I've well, never heard like, that. Yeah. You haven't yeah, seen the documentary? So like, he laid out no. the oh, match in a, in a notebook and he laid out and he numbered every single spot. And so he gave this notebook to Ricky Steamboat and he says, memorize this. And it was the entire match laid out. And so he would quiz him. They'd be in the locker room. He's like, what's spot four? What's spot 113? And like, he would have to like rattle them off. Not have to, but he did because it was like, Obviously, worth it because they had the best match. I mean, that match is one of the greatest WrestleMania matches of all time. Man, I love that. I, I wait. What's that on? It was the Randy Savage documentary on uh, Andy. Oh no, I have not. Yeah, seen they it. did. They did one on Austin. Um, uh, who was Roddy Piper? Middle? Was What's in it, the middle. It, it, is it called Piper. Inside yeah. or? Oh, it's on Randy Doc or Randy Savage. You know. I'll find it. Yeah, I was going to say, go go to A&E, you'll find it. Anyway, the point of the story is, is that, to me, if you were going to build a match kind of like that match with Savage and Steamboat, this was kind of the equivalent thereof in a New Japan style where you brought out fucking tables and had all kinds of crazy spots before, during, and after that shit. <laughs> Is it the best match I've ever seen? I hate to say that. It's one of the best matches I've ever seen. It's definitely on my list of match of the year candidate. I said it. I said it before the match even started and not knowing who's going to win. I think it's borderline impossible for these two to have a bad match. It just can't happen. You know when you know when it's good though when I went in being like, well, there's no way Shingo wins this. There's no way Shingo wins it. And then there's a couple near falls where you're like, oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Uh, uh. There's always one definitive one and that's the one that you're always disappointed with because the match is over. 44 minutes, those dudes could have fought forever. I wouldn't have been mad with the yeah, hour the, draw. The three count the three count is like here in the last bump of the night. Right. Uh, and and it was a storm breaker. It's all downhill which I get. from there. Yeah. yeah, right. You hear me. I'm like, uh. Um, <laughs> let, let's just do the G1 conversation now because it's coming up, right? No, we got um, Wrestle Grand Slam. Uh, I think that's one of their two or three outdoor. Uh, well, never mind. I'm just super yeah, psyched yeah, about the G1. Yeah, you got a show and a Tokyo Dome show. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you got to go admit it. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think they're going to push it back into like August, September, where it kind of usually is, but not exactly in the if same spot. Any of my relatives are listening. That analogy that I had about cocaine, that was just what I've got, gotten from movies. You've heard, like you've I've heard, heard, heard purely speculative. I've heard that stuff happens like that when you're on cocaine, which is a bad drug. Horrible, and you should never, never buy ever. unless you're going to share some with your cousin, <laughs> nephew, whatever I am to you. Um, <laughs> man, I, I want to go get a beer, but I got to do that three count. I'll go get the beer, man. Shit, you act like it's too fucking far away. I'll go get the beer. How about that? No, I'll go get. It. No, I'll, I'll start it. Blood and guts. Uh, we'll go with the three count. Um, obviously, a a w. Promoted the blood and guts match where you had obviously the pinnacle versus um, the inner circle in a double ring um, cage match, very similar to the war games match. It basically was war games, same rules, so on and so forth. Um, I'll start. Um, no, I'll take over. It's my count. Okay, go ahead. Shit, nigga. So let me ask you. Do you think that it lived up to the hype? I guess is what I'm asking. I, you know, I'm not going to do what Jason says here. And it goes, I'm going to ask the panel. I'll start. <laughs> I'm going <gonna laughs> to actually ask the panel. <laughs> so the pinnacle goes over. Uh, they end up surrendering because it looks like MJF is going to throw Y2J off, you know, uh, Shivani made a big deal about it being concrete down there. Did you think it lived up to the hype? Do you think it was worth the time that it got, Jason? 
Yes and no. Um, a lot of more, a lot more positives than negatives. Um, Ward Low comes out looking like a beast. Sammy Guevara is going to be the next great big baby face. Um, MJF, obviously, on the flip side, you know, any heat that he got is going to be magnified by taking out Jericho. Um, the two big negatives, um, obviously, the finish where. The camera angle basically showed the nice little soft landing that Jericho had, and um, shit, not, I saw, forgot the second. Yeah, uh, the commercials. Um, the commercials I, always take the they always take the piss the, out of stuff. And then, in a, in a scenario like this, I think it was two or three commercial breaks. It was two for sure. But a match like that, when you put that much into it, you're gonna have to figure out a way to kind of make sure you limit the commercials as much as possible. When I don't work for a network, but I know that there are times when they say, this is brought to you commercial free by Bill Downey, Blank. you know, Bill, whatever. Beer's Bill Company. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. Do it like that. When Wardlow came in and was basically like, okay, you could kind of feel the match getting ready to change a little bit. That's why I was like, okay, yeah, let's, you know, let's see what's getting ready to happen. And you start to go to commercial. I'm like, man, God damn it. You know, this, Wargo is going to be one of your next big stars. MJF, Jungle Boy, Wargo, in no particular order. That's going to be like the next wave of young homegrown talent, so to speak. You can't take away from that spot from Wargo's just so you can pay the bills. You know what I'm saying? There's, when Jake Hager came in, no disrespect to Jake Hager. If you want to do it then, knock your fucking self out. But just pick and choose the spots. Was it worth the hype? Yes and no. Zach, what do you think? Um, I think it was worth the hype, but I agree uh, with Jason's sentiments. I, I'm i sure that, you know, I don't think AEW is, like, thoughtless in this process. So I think that as far as the commercial breaks is probably something that was relegated to them by TNT um, unless they were to go search out that sponsor, you know, on their own and have that, I, you know, I don't know how those things work either, but I feel like commercial breaks are kind of outside of your control. They usually do those intros without those opening matches without commercial breaks and stuff. But um, you know, they usually have, you know, plenty throughout the rest of the show. Um, as far as that's one thing that might be out of their control, right? One thing that was in their control was the, the camera shot. Uh, nobody wants Chris Jericho to Mick Foley it, right? Not at all. Um, un- unless you're a total, like, creep, like an idiot. Like, nobody wants to see him just fly off a cage through a table. Yeah, we're all uh, on the so, same page that the shit is staged and that they're all stuntmen and they're just trying to tell a cool story. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that because I thought the story was incredibly well done. And uh, this seemed like uh, a big beginning, right? But, like, mm-hmm. it is a beginning. And uh, I'm anxious to see what comes out of this because, like, MJF and Jericho played it so well, especially. Uh, and you, like Jason said, you made stars in the match, too. Like, those guys were just giving it their absolute all. And um, I think it was, was overall a, a great pigs. success. I was going to say Dax Harwood. Yeah. Gee, no, Cash, too. Shit. Uh, which yeah, ones, most uh, of the Dax is there. the bald-headed like, guy. Cash has hair. Dax started well, yeah. the match. Dax, Dax the had a, he had a rough go, hour. Yeah, he got go, opened up early. But then, like, Cash got opened up, like, halfway in the match. And he was bleeding just as bad. I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ. What the fuck is this? So, okay, th- there you go. I guess there's the other thing. The blood and guts moniker of the uh, of the match lived up to it. You had plenty of fucking color, okay? And that's more times than not what we ask for matches like this. You know what I'm saying? When Hell in a Cell comes around, you don't see them. You don't see color, so it kind of takes away from, you know, what they did from the past from, you know, God forbid when – Nick or Nick Foley. Mick Foley got thrown off the fucking uh, top of the cage. You know, that's obviously one of the iconic moments. This would be one of the iconic moments when you have the next blood and guts match for AEW, but they, they advertised it and they still delivered after that. And I think that's kind of, you know, 
kudos to AEW in that sense because they you, they said it and you, it basically delivered it in some form or fashion. So I'm going to say, well, go real ahead. Real quick before go you ahead, start, Zach. I just yeah. want to say, I just want to interject a little bit of uh, like information. Uh, this was also the first time AEW has ever been number one on cable. So they totally killed it. Like a 1.09 million. They were like number one on cable for the first time. And they usually do well in the ratings, but I think that says something. I mean, seriously, good for them. No, That's awesome. No, it is good for them. I'll just say this. If you look at the the first four numbers since they broke away from uh, NXT, it was 1.2 just a little over a million, and it went dipped down to last week was like nine hundred thousand, and now it's back up to one. That was the Biden speech. Well, like there was like the, look, everybody died. Yeah. I'm, the, I'm, I'm not, not going to say yeah. I'm them. not I'm making just, excuses I'm just for saying, it. That's what they I'm, get yeah. for booking Biden on AEW Dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say this: if we can keep it at that million, even if if it's one point oh nine million, that million needs to be the benchmark, and it, it can't get any lower than that. If you can start with that and keep that momentum going forward, I think that's at least should be the foundation that you can kind of build an audience from that point on. Now, Zach said he had a few things to say. He's, he almost got through the first one. Yeah, right. Oh, no, that, I just said I had some information to say that was, that was it. I just wanted to talk about the rating. Um, you know, a few, thing, a few things I'll say. I didn't mind the last spot. I know that there was a lot of shit talking because Jericho went through a crash pad. Fucking A. Who gives a fuck, man? Nobody wants him to fucking die. Go through a crash pad. The guy's 50 years old. He's too valuable to the company. And I don't think that critics would have been as hard on that spot if the uh, exploding death ring thing debacle whatever we're calling that wouldn't have happened now you've set a precedent to where you you build right. these matches up and now the finish is going to be shit the second thing the same people that are bitching about jericho going through the crash pad are the same people that were telling AEW that they were too reckless when matt hardy almost right. fucking died right. in that match against sammy guevara right. so what do you where really- everybody was saying hey hardy you shouldn't be wrestling like this anymore. Right. Please stop. Yeah. You know we we beg of you, which is because that was vicious. Which, it was no question about it. He, you could if you watch that match, anybody can watch that match, and you can tell that Matt Hardy was out on his. Feet. Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Uh, the the third thing is from a booking standpoint, I think it would have gone further. If MJF, and then you can avoid Jericho going through the crash pad. If MJF acts like he's going to throw him off and then shows him mercy, and then MJF has all this talking, all these, all this bravado from being like, dude, I could have fucking killed you. There was one time I was at Jack Patrick's and this guy, this super drunk guy, you know him. I won't say his name on air, but you know him. And he punched, he punched me in my face and it didn't hurt. But he broke my glasses. glasses. And I took him. I was sober as a priest, and he was drunker than shit. And I took him, and his face was in the concrete. And I was like, dude, I could kill you right now. I was so fucking mad. Now, I'm not acting like Mr. Tough Guy here because he was fucking wasted. <laughs> but I could have fucking killed him, and I was so <laughs> mad at him. But then he unfriended me the next day on Facebook. So who really wins? Yeah, right. I could have killed him. <laughs> you about to say, who's the winner? <laughs> I'm the big winner. <laughs> so I just, I wish that MJF would have just showed him mercy because then you have, you have a, a year's worth of promos. Rights, yeah. I mean, you know, I could have finished you. I could have killed I could, you. Yeah, Your any, career would be done if yeah. I wouldn't have shown you mercy. And that well, sounds a little bit meaner to me. I think going to sell it. I think Jericho's going to sell it big. You know, it's not like he'll just be on Dynamite next week. Um, sure, I, think I, I do. Th- be, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he took a break. Yeah, for sure. And then it's going to be him versus Daniel Bryan in Japan like next <laughs> month. <laughs> Nobody sees this shit, right? Close that forbidden door. No, but I don't. I don't mind. I don't mind the spot though. I don't mind the camera work. I don't mind the spot. Go ahead and lay, lay, lay on the land on the crash pad. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it either. I'm scared of fucking heights. You know what I'm saying? That I, I, I can't believe I fly on airplanes. I'll just say this. And Zach says it a lot too. New Japan 
does their camera work so well. So when, you know, on point of impact, they turn the camera. So where you still get that moment, but you, you might miss, you know, if they miss a little bit to the left or to the right, you don't really see that bit big, big a deal. That was something I think you could have avoided. Okay. You know, this spot is coming. You could have avoided that spot. Now, why they didn't, I'll let you guys tell it. But to me, it's not like this was something that was, you know, they out could, of the blue. They could have okay. had a camera on, on top. top. Of, there you go. There's all sorts of things they could have done. It, it took us, what, 30 seconds to think about that. I'm not going to fault them too much. Maybe, no, maybe no, logistically the, it didn't work. It's not the end of the day. But like you said just earlier, when you have the specter of the exploding bar, barbed wire death match finish on top of this. You want to make sure you want to get this one right. I do want to say that war games slash blood and guts, <laughs> not my favorite type of match. This one kept me very entertained. It was the one that I turned on after uh, Shingo Osprey, and I was like, "This just isn't the same thing." Well, I just, I just prefer in ring stuff. I don't like the walking and fighting. I don't like the punches. My favorite spot in the match probably was when Guevara did that Spanish fly. Him and Spears were on mm. different rings. Oh, yeah. me too. That was my that was my favorite spot. Too. That was my favorite spot of the match. Let's give I, uh, Sean Spears so a little credit this. for this match oh, too. I I mean. d- listen, I. I, I know that I'm rough on Sean Spears, <laughs> you know, because he, he has no ch- charisma and he's not a very good wrestler, but he did take that Spanish fly very good. <laughs> I watched this um, because uh, I was at work. I was busy for Cinco de Mayo. Uh, I locked the door. We closed at eight and I was able to get it, lock everybody out and do my money and stuff. Taking trash out during commercial breaks. So I didn't mind the commercial breaks because I could like, get some shit done. But, uh, as far as the um, match itself, I just feel like, uh, you know, rate it overall in war games. I think it would rate pretty high for me on a recency bias because of the current storytelling. I'm anxious to see where it goes. But uh, Dexter and I, before we go to bed, because he's been like sleeping with me and we watch either Star Wars or we watch uh, like he likes cage matches and like death matches and shit because he's 11. Dude, so, what the fuck? Uh, we, that's good yeah, parenting. That's good parenting. Yeah. So, like, he likes the... Uh, How's so we, the we only non-parent the, in the room, you know, a little offended at this point? I mean, it's pro wrestling. So, like, we've been watching, uh, we've been watching like, old war games and stuff. And uh, this, this one, you know, ranks pretty high. You know what's funny is you talk about uh, being a parent and not showing them. The, I remember when I was at my grandfather's house, Grandpa Alex, out in Old Monroe, Missouri... And we were watching wrestling, and all my grandpa did when we watched wrestling, I was probably like six or seven years old. He would just cackle. Like, he thought it was the funniest <laughs> fucking shit. He just, like, all he did was think it was funny. That's probably why I, like, my favorite wrestlers are the funniest ones, you know? But I remember when Abdullah the Butcher pulled out a fork, and I, I, had, I like, it, I flashed back to flashback to it when Ortiz pulled out that fork no, the other Santana, night. Santana, actually. Sorry, Santana. And you know yeah, me. You know me. the same. Uh, but when he pulled out that fork, like something dropped in my stomach, <laughs> and I like I had a flashback to it. I was like, "Holy shit!" Like I remember that. I remember being like, "Grandpa, what the fuck? Like, what is this guy doing?" <laughs> right? I'm stabbing this dude with the fork. I'm stabbing this dude with the fork. I'm like, that, that's that's where I was like, you know, it once again, it just it li- that's where it lived up to the hype. It's the little things that it might not make a big difference. To me, I'm I'm with you on this one, Bill. Ultimately, it doesn't make a big difference. It didn't take away from the fact that I came away thinking, okay, what's next? Is Sammy Guevara going to be the de facto leader of the inner circle? You got, you know, little, um, I guess, views that you can roll off with obviously they did they did a great job throughout the match to follow up on the story that came last week during the parlay right where it was one guy versus one guy they did a great job of that and for that i really appreciate the way that the match was laid out yeah for sure because you made it a point to pay off everything absolutely that you build up to this point when you had 
Hager versus Wardlow against each other. Yeah, obviously, you know, these are the two big hosses of each other's stable, but it made sense. They basically they, paid off that Sean Spears, Sammy Guevara shit with that one spot. Yeah, for sure. Now, there's a bunch of other stuff that happened on this mat, on this uh, card, and I know that uh, Zach didn't get a chance to watch all of it. That's okay. Mm-hmm. Not a whole lot happened. I think I just said a I bunch of stuff happened. I think I just, just said, said a, a bunch, bunch of stuff, stuff happened. happened but not, not a whole lot, lot happened. happened. <laughs> That's like, isn't that wrestling? Uh, <laughs> but next week, next week looks great. By the way, like I mean, as far as excitement about next week, oh, we got Yuji Nagata versus John Moxley. All right. So, oh my god. Yeah, let's talk about Yuji Nagata versus John Moxley. Yuji Nagata, the Japanese legend. Has not been on TNT since he was in WCW back in 1996. Man, I think they, pu- they pulled that shit out. I'm like, my head I think I'm so. Like, Yuji Nagata, fuck? who isn't the biggest name going in New Japan Pro Wrestling today, but obviously Moxley respects the fuck out of him. Well, no, uh, I'll go, I'll let uh, Two Beer talk about the Nagata uh, influence. In New Japan, I'll just say this. For me, um, Nagata is somebody that when I started watching New Japan, he's on the back end of his career. So all his great matches, obviously, I haven't seen. But then all of a sudden, he can pull out, you know, the this instant classic versus Suzuki. And, um, you know, a meaningless, not I wouldn't say a meaningless match, but just a match that ends up being... You know, something that was so great on a tour that had a uh, a night where you didn't have Okada or Naito, or whoever was, you know, supposed to be main event in or whatever the case may be. And the next thing you know, Suzuki and uh, Nagata pull out this, you know, 25, 30 minute banger. And you're like, what the fuck is this? I mean, this guy's, you know, 50 years old. And all of a sudden you see in this great match. So, I mean, he and uh, Moxley, I think, are going to have th- that same kind of physical match. The fact that you have, you know, this um, connection, I guess, is the best choice of words I'll go with, with WCW being in on TNT, and now you have AEW on TNT. I think that's an amazing fucking symmetry on the fa- on that fact. I'll just say this. Don't sleep on Nagata at this point. He'll probably lose this match. It's a, probably a safe bet. But I got the sneaky suspicion this is going to be one of them bad boys that's going to be hard hitting from the start to the finish. And Yuji Nagata will make some American fans on this match. And then hopefully those said American fans will take a sneak peek over at New Japan. So like ultimately, this is once again, rising ties floats all boats. It's probably predictable to finish, but ultimately the bigger picture is, I think, what's in store for us all. Subir, what do you think? Oh, man, like, uh, I'm so excited for this. Um, I've only been able to go back and watch Nagata in his heyday uh, on New Japan World, which I'm thankful for, and I'm happy to spend my 999 yen uh, every month. Because, uh, I mean, the dude, like you said, an absolute legend, two-time IWGP champion, um, like, just, I mean, you can like just read off the accomplishments, and like Jason said, he's hard hitting. Um, you know, like this is like a, a dream match for Moxley. Same way with like Suzuki, right? Like, and that feud absolutely ruled, especially because of the way that they kind of just charismatically linked. Um, because they're just two mean guys, right? And I think it's a similar kind of paradigm with Nagata, they're two mean guys. Even though Nagata's like lightened up in his old age, it seems, but he's still, you know, he's still awesome. So, like, uh, I mean, the guy, no slouch, huge, like, accomplishments, uh, in especially New Japan in the past. So, like, uh, I'm thrilled to see him back in American TV wrestling John Moxley. I mean, this is the kind of shit that we're living for right now is this cross promotion shit. Like, I know it's Nagata now, but like, just like insert like Suzuki, right? If like Moxley and Suzuki had a match on American television, like this is the kind of shit that could happen. Like it's making my dick hard. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I but can't. but it, I, here's the thing. Like, yes, I'm excited for this too. I don't know much about Yuji Nagata. I went, I've watched some YouTube stuff with him, but 
you guys sound like a couple of fucking marks, man. Like, out of all the people that we could bring over to fight John Moxley on American television, they're gonna send the old, the old fucking horse that's getting ready, that's just been studding out the whole time, instead of fucking fighting. Like, isn't there like how many more New Japan guys can you name that could challenge John Moxley for this title? That you'd rather see than Yuji Nagata. Twenty. Okay, Twenty. Like, like, like the country right now, you know, it's going to be an older guy because they got stricter protocols. It's going to be a while before he can go back into the country. So, like, you know, it's not just like don't come with me Wednesday. with logic. Don't come with me. <laughs> Do not come at me with facts. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll just. Say, I'm trying to be a dickhead over here, and I'll you're coming at me. Yeah, right. I'll go this far. Who do you want to take away from the, this current tour to bring over to challenge Moxley for the title? I mean, damn. Who's I'm, on the current tour? Okay, guys that that I have is Show there? Yes. I think the only show. I think the only person I'd rather watch Show that, fight. No, he's I, on the I tour. Think the only person you could say otherwise is Suzuki because Suzuki's an older guy and they don't have like plans for him. But right? they've already fought. So, like, I think, okay, but yeah, I mean, but they've already fought. And maybe he wanted, maybe he requested this. They just you know? had Kenta. Okay. That, okay. Now. They just had okay. Kenta. Okay. If you want to go there, let's go there. If there was, that's who should have beat Moxley right then. That way you take it back to Japan and then you have, you can, you have a bunch of different challengers. Now, if you want to make that argument, then I'm all for it. Let me, let me say this right here. The U.S. title, the IWGP U.S. title, is the Moxley title right now. Nobody's going to take it off of them because that is their foothold right. in America. Right. Nobody, nobody's going to. He, he, he's like one of the biggest champions. He's one of the biggest stars in Western wrestling. So, like, why would you take it off of him? He's right. the biggest draw in Western wrestling. And NJPW has. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Say, bigger than Kenny Omega? Oh yeah, yeah, but like, oh, yeah. there's a thing with Kenny. Like, oh, no, 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 Let the man speak. Of course, he's bigger than Kenny Omega. I ain't got what let the man mean, speak. What do you mean, of course? What do you mean, well, of course? In Western right? wrestling, yeah, totally. because he was in WWE. WWE yeah, come on, dude. He had a big star in WWE, not just in WWE. He's not a big cast. He's, he's no, a Cody. big star. <laughs> Yeah, he's a big Ooh. fucking star. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. What's that? What's that gift with uh, Bill Murray and Kingpin where he's like, "Whoa, Whoa. <laughs> you ain't shit." No, okay. okay. Look, I'm just saying. To me, Kenny Omega is always the devil's advocate kind of scenario. I will agree that John Moxley is big, bigger, probably more so for the fact of his time in WWE. That said, Kenny Omega. Is just as good. I want you in ring. I want you to listen to me very carefully. Okay, go ahead. Kenny Omega will never be as big of a star in the West as John Moxley because John Moxley is all fucking attitude, and Kenny Omega is all technique. Kenny Omega promos, even the one the other night, left a lot to be desired. Western wrestling fans put a lot more put more of a premium on promos than they do on in-ring shit. Agreed. That's why promos only happen in uh, in Japanese wrestling after the shit's done. When somebody's won, they get their flowers, they get to say whatever they want to. In Western wrestling, John Moxley gets to cut a promo every week. And he is fucking fantastic at it. In fact, I think that John Moxley has gotten better at it since he's been in WWE. Agreed. He, I mean, he's an incredible promo now. He's a must-watch promo every single promo he cuts. Even if, even if it's about nothing, he's fucking great. Kenny Omega will never reach that type of stardom in America, specifically. Okay. Because he's no, just... That, no, that, if, when you put it like that, that's totally fair. He's just not as good at it. Um, He's just not as cool. Kenny Omega is not as good promo wise as John Moxley, and th therein lies, the, I guess, the problem in hand. Well, it's not a problem for anybody except for Kenny Omega. It's not a problem I don't for think it's a problem for Kenny Omega. Kenny Omega's 
doing okay. Absolutely. It's just not a problem for AEW because they'll always have John Moxley. And John Moxley's right. Uh, I I mean I don't I don't even think you guys are arguing. I don't think we're disagreeing either. Okay, just making sure because I'm gonna say it, it feels like it, you know it might be a little bit of a disagreement All right. here. Alright, so no. So I mean we'll just say I'm right. Okay. Uh looks like Miro <laughs> Miro is fighting Darby Allen. Next week, Darby oh, Allen I got... Do lo- I, I do love this real quick. I, I read about it because I didn't see it, but I do love that Miro said that he is facing the guy who doesn't care if he dies, and uh, Miro is the guy who doesn't care if he kills him. I think yes. that's a great build. It, I mean, <laughs> shit. He just basically took out, you know, his best friend. You know, what the fuck is he going to do to Darby Allen? Well, and Darby Allen got thrown down some stairs in a pretty dangerous-looking spot yeah. this week yeah. by <laughs> Ethan Page and Scorpio Sky, and I think that was all to set this, up so that Miro takes this him is, out. This is also like, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of Darby Allen TNT matches, uh, and occasionally you think maybe he gets the title off of him. I This is a match where I'm like, I think he might get the fucking title off of him. I'm invested. Oh, he's t- no. It's either one Miro wins ways. the title. It's one of two ways. It's either a this goes into like the first, I guess, time limit draw that they've had in uh, a title match. I think uh, the TNT title. They did it with Cody. Okay, yeah, they did it once before. Okay, then this will be the second. Um, Cody and Orange Cassidy, right? I can't remember. I think it was Orange Cassidy. Yeah, because they had that kind of like, yeah, uh, kind of like weird pin at the end where, right. where Orange Cassidy rolled him up. Yeah, okay. it was that one. I would considering the way that they've kind of booked the the finishes of Darby Allen matches. I wouldn't be surprised to see the draw. I'm kind of leaning with Bill on this one. This feels like a way to get Miro the TNT title. No, no, I won't go that far. I'm, anytime you agree with me, I'm going to hit TNT. <laughs> <laughs> I think this might be a time to get Miro the tile because, I mean, it's – you got to have a big man or, like, a, some sort of monster heel well, running Al- around as a title holder. Darby's made. Darby's a made guy. Darby's a made you guy. Know? He's had the belt forever. It's been a little bit. So it's time to put it on somebody like Miro because Miro can be a big star for them. Uh, SCU. Wins the tag team uh, four-way match. They are going to fight the Young Bucks for the belts. It's a, it's a great storyline to finish up what they started on uh, AEW Dark. Now we get to ready to figure out what's getting ready to happen. Is this going to be a scenario where SCU takes the titles off the Bucks or the Bucks basically break up SCU? It's a good payoff. That's all That's all I ever ask is if you start this storyline – is you pay it off. There's certain storylines that that they kind of veered away from for whatever reason. So be it. Now they're I think they're starting to get back to the point and uh, NXT two where they're going with storylines and they're finishing it from start to finish. Zach. No, I think that's the play. If it was me, if I was the Booker, if I was Tony Khan, I'd put that thing on Miro. I think you have to at this point because I mean, it, it it's kind of hard to have guys like. Brian Cage, Lance Archer, and Miro all on the your roster, and none of them are champions. There's yeah, I yes, you took the words right out of my mouth. There's no reason that Darby Allen should still have this. Darby Allen should be in chase mode at this point, either chasing the TNT title or going after Kenny Omega. Exactly. Uh, speaking of Kenny Omega, he is fighting the winner of Orange Cassidy versus Pack last week. Kenny Omega disrespected the fuck. Out of Orange Cassidy last week during his promo, Orange Cassidy came out to just basically take it. Uh, didn't really say anything. Kenny Omega says, I see a lot of kids with hands in their pockets. Nobody can do what I do. He said sock hop. Come on, man. There's no way Orange Cassidy wins this, right? No, I think he wins it. You think Orange Cassidy goes over Pac? Good. Yeah, I, I think good. so I'm... because we've seen, we've seen Pac versus Omega twice. Only once in AEW, but it was one of the best matches we've seen in AEW. But Orange Cassidy, like I said, I think I just said this last week, Orange Cassidy versus Kitty is a money match. Like, that's money. If they do it, if I'm not mistaken, that's going to be at double or nothing, correct? Yes. Okay, so there's there's going to be live fans there, 5,500, give or take. So Orange Cassidy has a crowd. 
is what I you're, think, is and what I'm you're going saying. going with what we've said before on the pod, Orange Cassidy with the crowd. I think this – it's not a match that Kenny is going to lose. Kenny's not going to lose – any of these titles for a hot minute. Let's consider him like Roman Reigns on the SmackDown side. So that being said, you're going to have to put guys in front of him that are legitimately, you know, they have a chance, but ultimately Kenny is going to win. Pac has not even, it's more than, a, a, you know, a bit of a chance. You can see, legitimately see Pac taking the title off Kenny Omega. We can't have that. Not just yet. Right now, Orange Cassidy, as much as I hate to say it, I expect him to beat Pac in some form or fashion and be the uh, the opponent for Kenny Omega. Uh, we have QT Marshall versus Cody Rhodes. I don't think anybody ever thought QT was going to win. Cody Rhodes goes over. Anthony Agogo is it Anthony Agogo. Mm-hmm. Anthony Agogo comes out, gives him a liver punch, and then Drake. They've been throwing that liver punch hard, though. I, I kind of like that. I'm anxious to see what Anthony Agogo does. He has, like, star power. Yeah, I, um, I agree. He's got personality. You know, he's a pretty boy, in it, which is one of the things I don't like, but I do like the fact that they're leaning into that uh, liver punch because, I mean, shit. Ask uh, Oscar De La Hoya. That Joker is no joke. Well, it's it's It'll different. It's different too. Nobody else. Nobody else does it. You know. Yeah, you'd see like you know knockout punches. Ronnie Garvin is the guy that I think of off the top of my head. But I mean, nobody goes to the gut and then ha- and then you have somebody sell that punch. Cody selling that punch gives a go go instant credibility. Now that said, we're getting ready to find out next week when he gets into the ring. You know. What can he do past this one punch? All right. Uh, that's going to do it for our three counts. One, two, three. Okay, so I lied about the end of the three count. Uh, the odds and ends is just going to be NXT, which oh, used to be the Wednesday Night Wars, you know. But no, it's, it's, We can separate them now. I mean, they deserve to be separated. NXT had a great show. NXT, NXT deserves to be relegated to the odds and ends. I'm joking. It was a good show. It was bookended very well. It, uh, oh, the bookends no. of this show were, were awesome. All right, so tell me what you thought about Leon Ruff versus Swerve. Oh, dude. This match, like... Overachieved for like fucking everything, a. but the last one minute, like it was so phenomenal. Like I turned this on this morning and I'm laying in bed. I'm like being a piece of shit. I don't want to get out of bed. My kids do remote school, so like they're also old enough to get their own breakfast and shit. So like it's whatever. I just fucking get up whenever I get up. You're lucky I'm and, away. Uh, yeah, I turned this thing on and I'm fucking popping hard in my bedroom at fucking nine a.m. Right. Uh, this thing ruled. Like, uh, it really showcased Leon Ruff, what he can do, uh, more than any of those Gargano matches, even. Um, these guys just fucking killed it. I was a little ho hum on the finish, um, because I didn't know who that guy was. You don't like Swerve getting an entourage, though? I do like that. I do like that. I think that's cool. I just, I want to know, I want them to tell me who these people are, uh, because I don't know who they are. And as soon as they do, Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. It, I think that was cool. You know what? Like, I get so mad about AEW having nothing but factions that, like, when I see a new faction in NXT, I'm like, hey, here's a new faction. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? But, I mean, that's cool. I like that Swerve has three people in his entourage, two guys and a girl. I like that. I didn't know why. Like, like Zach said, when Leon Ruff decided to jump on that huge guy and then that guy gave him a great a great uh i mean it was basically an fu yeah uh or an attitude adjustment onto the say fu shit what it it hasn't been called an fu for a long time i'm showing my age jesus okay fair enough but i I enjoyed it i like swerve getting a team like zach said leon ruff you know i don't like you guys know me i don't like to tell you how right i was before but when leon ruff won that belt off of Johnny Gargano and you guys were like oh no it's just a it's just a quick one it doesn't mean anything Leon Ruff uh he's just gonna go back to the undercard after this that made Leon Ruff and Leon Ruff is a fun fun mid-card tiny wrestler (laughs) 
He's just so You can't even give him a compliment after you were getting ready to get <laughs> He's just out. tiny. He's tiny, man. I could I could I could pick two of him up. I could bench two of them. I would love to see the fact you took the chop from Stallion, so I won't I won't Thank you. I won't denigrate you too much. Yeah, don't. But two Leon Russ, I'd love to see that. I will go this far. I like I love this match. Let's just put it on the table. Love the match. I love the fact that you had all kinds of spots in and out of the ring. Uh the guy that caught um Leon Ruff is Something Francis? AJ Francis. So if you're watching any uh biographies, that's the uh the show after it where it's uh they're I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head, but they're going out and you know, reclaiming WWE um I guess you know, merch not merchandise, but like clothing that they wore where like um what was the most recent episode? They got the urn back when Mankind turned on... Well, Paul Bearer turned on Mankind. Or check that out. Paul Bearer turned on The Undertaker with Mankind, and the urn was the question. So they tracked down the urn. Jerry Lawler, you know, they were tracking down some of his shit. AJ Francis is basically the star of the show. So, unfortunately, I knew his face. I just couldn't place name with face. So when I saw it, I'm like, okay, that's cool. But ultimately, you know, they didn't do a good enough job to make the connection between this is who get, this guy is and this is who the same guy is catching Leon Ruff. Outside of that, I have no problem with Swerve having an entourage. I think it's great that he has a woman in a part of this entourage. I'm waiting for somebody else that's not um, – Hardy family order to actually throw a woman into their fucking mix, but neither here nor there. I think that ultimately it gets Swerve moving forward, whether that's the North American title or ultimately the uh, the NXT title. It doesn't make Leon Ruff look weak. So in, in that scenario, to me, it's win-win. Horny Jason talking about he's glad that there's a woman there. Uh, let's see here. What else? Would you not, not like Naomi as a part of the bloodline with fucking Roman Reigns? I'm horny too, man. I'm just not talking about it. Uh, <laughs> Cameron Grimes, uh, Ted DiBiase is back. Ted DiBiase, Cameron Grimes and Ted DiBiase are so fucking funny to me. Yeah. I laughed out loud yeah. when he yelled, DiBiase, <laughs> you, they, they got me. No, I've, I've been the most vocal critic on this. They got me on this one. I mean, what DiBiase pulled up, you know, you knew what was getting ready to happen, and I still fucking laugh. What you think, Zach? That's what's up. Oh, this is too funny. Like Cameron Grimes is in the perfect spot for this and I don't know how it ends up I don't even care like it could go on for seven eight more weeks and I'll laugh every time like uh, they're just fantastic together so uh, yeah this is totally fine with me. totally agree we had Grizzly Young Veterans versus Ciampa and Thatcher Ciampa and Thatcher are my new favorite tag team they're fucking awesome together they're kind of evil but they they like hide it beneath. They're just being gritty. They you use know? the shoe, man. Yeah, yeah, it was all right. <laughs> they use the shoe, dog. Do you okay. think they're heels? As it, I mean, look. If they're building up to a Thatcher and Champa versus MSK, that I'm here for that. Yeah, I think ultimately that's where it goes because I don't think that. I guess here's my bigger problem with it. Grizzly Young veterans can take some hits, but you can't just keep hitting them with these kind of losses. At some point, you're going to have to get them the big win. There's not another really good NXT tag team. Do you think they lost anything in this loss, though? I don't. No, I'm not saying that it's this is the loss that's going to have them on their decline, but you keep doing this the way that we talked about earlier where WWE has teams or people with loss after loss after loss. They might lose a little momentum. There's people that don't like GYV because Zach Gibbs is not entertaining them. And I totally get that. I think he's goddamn comedy to me, but I get that. 
The great part of route wrestling is entertainment, and entertainment strikes people in different ways. I just think that those people are going to lose interest, even those people that might have, like, you know, that, you know, they're good, but if you keep having them lose, they will jump off the fucking train, too. What do you think, Zach? Oh, I didn't get to see this match, but I am very much invested in Ciampa and uh, Thatcher as a tag team. And uh, I think both those guys being like veteran performers and also being a foil to like MSK because it's totally in a style clash. Uh, I really would love to see that match. So like, I, I think it's cool. No, I think it's going to happen. I mean, obviously... Uh, we With have, them winning, I think this this is the next match coming up. So we have Kushida versus Santos next week. That seems cool. Two out of three falls. Yeah. Uh, Saray seems like kind of a dangerous wrestler. Did it look like she fucked that chick up pretty bad? I didn't think so. What, what, what do you mean? I guess there was a spot where she went for like a big knee against the rope. And I saw a gif of it that Kurt Stallion retweeted, and it looked pretty rough. Pretty rough. I'll just say this. As the only person of this panel that watches Japanese women's wrestling, if I saw that, I didn't even blink. So take it for what's worth. <laughs> I, watch, I watch Japanese women's wrestling. I just don't watch current stuff. Okay, uh, in the tag match, we had Indy Hartwell and Shotzi Blackheart go over Ember Moon. Or, sorry. Wait. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, Indy you're Hartwell, right. Yeah, and went over Ember Moon and... Shotzi Blackheart. Indy Hartwell and Candice LeRae went over Shotzi Blackheart and Ember Moon. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, it, Never mind, I'm not even going to ask. Um, I can't tell my part. Jesus Christ. Uh, it was a fun match. Lots of big spots. Called. Lots of big spots. And Indy Harwell had a lot of these big spots, and that's why I was trying to say that, you know, I know Zach is, you know, not necessarily the biggest Indy Harwell fan, and I agree that she's green, but I think this is maybe not her breakout moment, but one of these moments where you can kind of tell that she has this talent to be able to move forward whenever they decide they want to break up the way. And even Indy Hartwell goes with Dexter Loomis. God forbid it's too long. Or she goes solo dolo. Indy Hartwell has got some places to work with. And this match basically so the fact that she can take bumps and she can deliver bumps well. And the fact that, to me, that was the biggest thing that I took away from the whole match when you had three other legitimate other women that could come in and do whatever they wanted. Indy Hartwell, to me, was the standout performer in this match. Uh, Zach, what do you think? Yeah, I was actually surprised at the finish. Uh, I didn't think that uh, they were actually going to take the titles because in the Johnny Gargano, uh, Austin Theory, um, that motherfuckers left. Yeah, like, <laughs> he, yeah, it took off, and he's like, "Oh, we're going to start the celebration for them because they were just like ready yeah, to head out." I didn't think it was actually going to happen. <laughs> How you going to leave? Those kids are pretty funny, like. Austin Theory, like, saying, like, oh, they're so big. Oh, they got to be real. <laughs> attitude and, era yeah. shit, man. Yeah, it is. is yeah, don't, get me wrong. don't get me wrong. It, it is attitude it era totally, shit, but I did laugh. Yeah, I laughed, and I don't appreciate it, but, like, he delivered it well. Like, it was, like, a, sure. a, a total shit gimmick, but he, he delivered it well. Um, but, yeah, like, uh, these gals just totally put it all on the line, and, Candace has a history of hardcore matches. Like, um, you know, she's gotten color more than any other woman that I've ever seen. And, um, like, Shotzi's crazy. Uh, so they just did it. They went out there and did it. And But I was surprised at the title change. Uh, no, I, agree, I agree with that. We also had a promo between Raquel Gonzalez and Mer- Mercedes Martinez. I'll say this about that promo exchange is that Raquel Gonzalez is a terrible promo. Mercedes Martinez, pretty good promo. They were both uh, in relief 
with each other because Mercedes Martinez saying that I paved the way exactly for people like you is exactly right. And Raquel Gonzalez looked like she was doing a promo on Tough Enough. It was a shit promo. I won't say it was a shit promo, but I will say she came across the total baby face and she's the heel of the match. So it's this constant like thing that's going on with Mikkel, uh, where she seems to be a baby face, but she's positioned as a heel and it's weird. No, I, I would agree with that. I agree with both of you, actually. Uh, I won't say it was a shit promo, but it, it exposed one of the weaknesses of Raquel Gonzalez. And unfortunately, if you're going to make her the champ, she's going to have to take the mic. And this is going to be, unfortunately, one of the byproducts of that. That said, I do agree with Zach. It, I just wish that there was – I wouldn't even say that I wish there was a queer heel or baby face – but Raquel Gonzalez has kind of bled into the gray area of heelish slash babyface behavior, when, especially, when, like I said last week, when you give um, EO her props for the match the la- last week. I don't even think that heel should give props to babyfaces. You know, thanks for showing up. Thanks for bringing me the title, shining up for me. You know, do something like that versus saying how great the opponent was you know, how great the match was, so on and so forth. But, yeah, ultimately, I agree with both of you guys. I think the match is going to end up paying itself off, but the build has been a lot to be desired for sure. And then there was an absolute... I like, I like the format, though. That format was cool. Like, yeah, I, I liked it, too. They... Then there was an absolutely apeshit segment where Karrion Cross comes out. I can't tell if Karrion Cross is supposed to be a baby face or a heel. Maybe he's supposed to be a tweener. He's certainly, like, holding the mic up to try to get the crowd to chant. He is also talking about giving the fans what they want, which is not a heel move. Uh, He has his valet, uh, Penelope, is that right? Oh, my God, Scarlet. Scarlet, thank you. Uh, He has Scarlet, who is, like, doing this. It's just not congruent with what his character is. She is acting like, I don't know, like some goth chick or something. Am I wrong, Zach? No, it's a weird gimmick. And especially for Scarlett, I know her main strength is her look. She's very marketable. Uh, She's an okay wrestler, but, like, uh, she is not wrestling, right? Like, she did not get signed to WWE to wrestle, apparently. Uh, because she's not, like, even in any kind of, like, contest with any of these women. So uh, that's interesting. But, yeah, uh, it was a weird segment because, uh, like you said, it's hard to say where he's positioned because of the way he talks, but he is kind of obviously the heel, uh, but he doesn't talk like a heel, and then the heel went over three dudes. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, is he obviously the heel though? Because Kyler Riley comes out in a fedora, and that's not a baby face move to me. What do you think, Jason? <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I wish I could rock the fedora. No, this this was really an interesting segment, especially when uh, Johnny Gargano comes out and jumps uh, carrying cross from behind. The first two guys, uh, Kyler Riley, obviously, we saw their uh, their backstage crossing of the pass or whatever the case may be, no big deal. Um, Pete Dunn was kind of, you know, calling, you know, guys out, you know, who wants a piece, a piece of Pete Dunn. I thought this was where Daniel Bryan might come in to play after losing to uh, Roman Reigns on SmackDown. But obviously with uh, his contract uh, negotiations, that's not in the, in the cards, so to speak. So, obviously, when I saw this, you know, the mini fight unfold, I'm thinking, okay, we got a triple threat for whatever takeover's coming up. This is going to be cool. Um, Did I say Finn Balor? Finn Balor came out. Cross came out. Cross was first. Finn Balor, uh, Pete Dunn, and then Johnny Gargano came out at the very end. Okay, so, you know, you would have Gargano, not Gargano, but um, Pete Dunn, Finn Balor, and cross as the triple threat, which would have been, which sounds like an amazing triple threat. Well, you throw Kyle, Kyle O'Reilly in there, so it's a, it looks like a four-way. 
So right. here's what happened. Karrion Cross came out. Kyle O'Reilly came out next. Pete Dunn came out. Like Finn, every opening Raw you've ever seen. Right. Finn Balor, before he could... He talked shit about O'Reilly and Dunn. Before he could get to Karrion Cross. Karrion Cross just knocked him out. And then... No, well, Finn Balor... Finn, Finn Balor, first, we'll do the first part. And then Austin Theory and Gargano came out and fucked up Karrion Cross from behind because Austin Theory and Karrion Cross are having a match next week, which I'm very much looking forward to. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know when the next takeover is. I don't know if they're going to wait for a takeover. All oh, I, I know is should. that I'm very intrigued with Karrion Cross as a babyface because I think that he has a very I think he's a very good seller. I think that he sells the fuck out of shit. I'm not sure that Cross is, I mean, I guess you can, in this scenario, I guess he's the baby face because, you know, you got. He is not a heel. I don't think he's a baby face. I mean, oh, he, doesn't I mean come off, he doesn't come across as a baby face. This is like the story face. of NXT right now, unfortunately. Again, we're not, we're not saying anything Dr. different. Luma. Same thing with yeah. Kyle O'Reilly. You can't Kyle wear a fedora O'Reilly's and be a face. No. <laughs> See, no, that's just you, you know, hating on fedoras, okay? Kyle O'Reilly is the baby face. You ever met he, a guy in a fedora that you liked? I'd have to think about that because, you know, <laughs> give me 30 seconds. He was probably talking about how you don't respect your female enough. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't shit, motherfucker. Kyle O'Reilly's a baby face, okay? Pete Dunn's obviously a heel. Gargano, heel. I don't know. I don't know if Pete Dunn's definitely a heel. It what? just seems like a bunch of tweeners to me. Pete Dunn is a total heel. They they face Austin him like, Theory and Johnny Gargano were heels, heels. definitely. Okay, but Karen Cross seems is like the a tweener. Only tweener Kyle O'Reilly seems like a tweener. No, he's a baby. Pete Dunn face. seems like a tweener now. He's a baby face. Finn Balor, I guess, is a baby. Wait until uh, Adam Cole comes back. Then you want remember once Who? again. Adam Cole, baby. baby. You remember once again, he's a baby face. All right. Well, I I guess I'll look forward to that match. What? Well, Ultimately, I guess the biggest thing I took away from this is what's next. Are we doing triple threat? Are we doing a fatal four way? Because now you've NXT, I think, and I'll just say it for myself personally. I love the fact that they broke away. They being AEW and NXT broke away from each other because now I think we're getting organic storylines from both sides and both sides I think are doing a good job post uh, Wednesday Night Wars. NXT is now back to it's starting to feel like the old NXT when you had the hour program and then you know next thing you know you look up you have an NXT title match or you have an NXT women's title match or whatever the case may be. AEW is kind of doing their own thing the same way. Just focusing on NXT for 30 seconds. I like the fact that you've already got these matches already kind of set up looking forward. And on the back end, they're bringing in another storyline or two to kind of continuously give that flow to NXT again. You put it back in full sale, now you got something going. This is from which, which button are you pushing? Pick a button. I guess I hit them both. I fucked up. <laughs> um, so... This is bam from ringside. Okay, we're gonna move on. <laughs> we're gonna move on to Raw real fast. Uh, Raw was terrible. Anybody watch it? It sucked. I no, I watched it. Do you agree that it sucked? I, I didn't think it was bad. It just didn't feel like it was any different. And if this is the first reg- week of the Jason Jordan regime, it doesn't feel like it was anything different. Uh, what is it with John Morrison calling him drip drip, calling himself drip drip? What do you think is up with that? Do you think he's trying to make the boys in the back laugh or something? Like, what the fuck is that? It's terrible. It's what the kids say. I All right. Do. They do? I uh, yeah. I did just text Bill, Bill and drip, Jason. Drip a, uh, UG... I just texted Bill and Jason and Eugene and got a Kurt Angle match from Wrestle Kingdom 2 in 2008, so... Hey, man, we're not talking Enjoy about that. Kurt Angle versus Eugene Degato. We're talking about uh, Sonya Deville uh, get, getting mad at Adam Pierce. This is what wrestling is. So, do you, <laughs> do you have any thoughts about that or not? Do you have any thoughts about Angel Garza putting a rose down Drew Gulak's pants and then kicking him oh. in the ass? 
Okay. Let's just hope that Vince didn't find that funny. Yeah, because that was going to Because that. if he did, that's his new gimmick. He's going to be shoving roses up motherfuckers' ass. Dude, I was going to say like, that, that are the endorsement I might for have, Telefor is on deck. I might have told this story on the podcast before, but there was a time where some WWE guys, every time they came through town, they would they came into the bar that I worked at downtown. <laughs> Jack Patrick's not a sponsor. And they would give me tickets, and I would just... The the, there was a, a couple times they Extreme would sit at the bar, rules. and I would just I would just <laughs> talk to them, and I would ask them all sorts of questions. And one of the guys was a guy that was included in a skit with Great Khali, where he had to wear like an apple on his head, or like he was wearing like a diaper, and it was supposed to be it was super racist. It was like this Indian thing that was supposed to be happening because I, re- I don't remember that the guy was Mexican. And the guy oh, was course. the guy was brownish, you know. Oh, Jesus Christ! And, <laughs> and you don't have the decency to cough up money for a good Indian. Well, no, Vince thought this guy fucked up the week before on SmackDown, and Vince thought it would be funny to have the great Kali come out and do a skit with him. And I remember being like, "Why would Vince do this? Nobody wants to watch this." And the guys that had worked for Vince forever said to me. When you're a billionaire, there's very few things that make you laugh. Like, you have all this power that nobody else has. So, when you think about Angel Garza kicking a rose up Drew Gulak's ass, like, it really is, like, the most dangerous game type stuff. Like, they're just trying, he's just trying to do, like, he's an actual sadist, probably. He probably doesn't know it, and when you're there day to day, you probably don't realize it, but it's fucking stupid. Nobody enjoys it. Nobody enjoys it. Nobody enjoyed Garza kicking a rose up Drew Gulak's ass. I'm not going Nobody. Disagree. I'm not going to disagree with that. I'll just say Good. this. The fact that we were even talking about it is the problem with Raw to begin with. Just let the product speak for itself. Sports entertainment is good. I like the Sony Deville angle. Actually, I, I'm really starting to love. No, I'm, I'm no, I'm liking it. They can't get away from the authority figure angle. Okay, that's just not going to happen. So you might as well just have an authority figure. Pick one or the other, whether it's Adam Pierce or Sonya Deville, that gets Charlotte back into the title picture and just run with it. Don't. That's one of those things that I think they should have never gotten away from. You're going to have to have an authority figure for something. Do you think? What if the NFL didn't have Roger Goodell? It would be fine. The NFL didn't have Roger Goodell for a long fucking time. It and had a Paul Tagliabue, a commissioner. Well, if they didn't have a commissioner, who gives a fuck? Yeah, right. Okay, until the, no, until the Rams get uh, fucked over uh, and then you're the first uh, one crying. Okay, nah, the, the bottom this line. One of your worst <laughs> takes. No, it's not a worst take. It actually makes sense. If you're going to change some shit, change the some NBA shit. has a commissioner and he's not a villain. And the, ask, and, the, I, I, and the NBA is the best fucking saying, sports league there is out I'm there. I'm saying that you have to have a commissioner. I don't give a rat's ass if he's face That's or heel. Fine. That, NXT has William Regal. He's fine. Okay. He's not a good okay. guy or a bad guy. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Have a fucking commissioner. Somebody that's going to run Raw, SmackDown, say, or whatever the case Zach? may be. I was just going to say, Vince, like Jim Cornette, as much as he's just out there, he did say one time something that I thought was very poignant, which was that Vince would rather make 10 cents his way than a dollar someone else's way. And that I think that speaks to his character very well. Sound about right. <laughs> <laughs> that sound about right to me. It's from ringside. All right. It's Fuck a, your couch. Listen, it's a huge birthday week if we're just talking about in-ring ability. Okay, I was getting ready to say, because there's one you you better be saying, otherwise we're going to have a problem. A huge birthday week, if we're just talking about in-ring ability. I'll start with the bad ones. Uh, Brian Knobs, 57. Uh, let me go around to a couple other bad ones. Not a whole lot. Hercules, 65. You think Brian Knobs is still alive? I think oh, yeah. so. Brian Knobs is yeah, still alive. I was about to yeah, say, I think yeah, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, think you, you think he's still nasty? Of course. Nasty as he wanted to be. <laughs> nice. Uh, okay, so now we'll move into some decent ones. Uh, Dakota Kai, mm. or it might be 
Tegan Knox. I can't tell, but I think it's one of them turns Je- thirty one this Jesus year. Jesus Christ, dude! I mean, come on, seriously. Is, <laughs> did Did you see her on Wednesday or no? Or Rob- Tuesday or no? Robert Rude is forty four. Glorious. And Billy Kidman is forty seven. Nice little shooting star splash. Now listen, I think to- he, I think he, I think he taught the. Uh, or uh, should he start splash? Yeah, yeah. Now listen to this in ring ability. Now these are all people that have their birthdays in May May sixth through May twelfth. Okay, Cole Cabana, Owen Hart, Tangaloa, Kevin Owens, Tommaso Ciampa, Io Shirai, Tito Santana, William Regal, Lince Dorado, and Gushida. Jesus Christ. That's a week? Yes. Dakota Kai 31. Owen Hart would have been 56. RIP. Tangaloa is 30, 38. KO. Kevin Owens is 37. Tommaso Ciampa is 36. Tommaso Ciampa is a year younger than Kevin Dude, he's Owens. fucking cut. <laughs> God damn. Io Shirai is 31. Tua Santana is 68. William Regal is 53. God bless you. Uh, Robert Roode is 44. I don't know if I already said that. Uh, Lynch, Lynch Dorado is 34. Kushida is 38. You think thir- that we would have seen Owen Hart and some G1? Like, Owen Hart? That would have been amazing. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, you know what's fucked up is that Kevin Owens, who's my current favorite wrestler, as everybody knows, named his kid Owen after Owen Hart and named himself Kevin Owens after Owen Hart, and they have the same birthday, too. It's fucked up. All right. I'm, I might say That's this. very cool. I might say this every year. I don't know. I can't remember what I said a year ago. I can't remember what I said ever. <laughs> that goes without saying on the pod, but that's okay. For F&B Eatery, R.I.P. R.I.P. Man. Check. For Tender Mahal. Check. For... Murray the Murray Man Murray for Check. Lucha Chris. Check. We're doing different music this week just because he's got the mic. And yeah, I hit the wrong one. Yeah. Because you, you can. You're the captain. For two beers, Zach Coleman. Two beer. Check. For Jason two Cornelius beer. Bell. Cornelius bitches. Listen, I want everybody to support your local restaurants. Thank you. Check. Support your local weed dealer because all that legal weed is making it too easy for the state to make money off of you getting high. Do not let them do that. Double check. You need to get high illegally so you can support the motherfuckers. (laughs) This was going off the rails late. (laughs) So you can support the motherfuckers. To take the risks, hey man, baby, <laughs> to bring you illegal weed. That's right. We we we'll drag it. We'll drag it to you or drive it to you. Well, whatever. No, maybe we won't. Somebody will. I won't. Did I say that? Also, I want to say that Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Check. I have other causes I'd like to talk about. <laughs> Can't remember any of them right now. <laughs> But for the record, I'm Bill Vagy. Everybody, boo the heels! If you know who the heels are. (laughs) They're the cops! They're the cops!